As I mentioned in the last lecture, there's a lot going on between uh, the various kingdoms within Al-Andalus, the Muslim area of Spain, as well as between the, the, the factions in the Christian kingdoms in northern Spain. So we don't want to overgeneralize or oversimplify the this the number of divisions. We don't want to just say uh, we we don't want to just conceive of Spain at this time as uh, divided between Christian Spain and Muslim Spain. Although those are familiar categories, uh, we can look at lots of different points in history and say, oh, look, the Christians were fighting the Muslims. We can look at the Crusades. We can look at uh, sort of jihadist campaigns in the Middle East today and easily divide the world into simple distinctions based on uh, religious uh, belief. But I mentioned that there were Christians and Jews in uh, all over Al-Andalus, all over the Muslim uh, territories, who had uh, rights to their own religions. They were uh, you know, likely to be promoted in government and that sort of thing. Uh, we also had alliances between uh, Christians uh, and Muslims within the Christian territories. We had alliances between uh, individual Christian kingdoms with Muslim kingdoms against other Christian kingdoms and you know, Muslim kingdoms and Christian kingdoms against other Muslim kingdoms. Uh, and sometimes Muslims and Christians on one side versus Muslims and Christians on the other side. Uh, so we would miss all of that and we would completely not understand the role of either the historical uh, Rodrigo Diaz or the narrative uh, protagonist uh, of El Cid uh, if we simplified things into these two, this kind of dichotomy. But it's for that reason that this text, this narrative, helps us to examine our own tendencies to divide people into categories and sort of label them as, uh, as category one or category two. Uh, but this is something that's not limited to uh, religious divisions uh, or any, or it's certainly not re limited to the Middle Ages. It's the kind of thing that we can see uh, happening thousands of years before that and it's something that we see uh, in our own way of thinking today. Just turn on the news and you'll see, see people described according to uh, some sort of identity category. And that is a very natural tendency as we'll see if we look at the medieval kingdom of Oklahoma. Uh, okay, this is uh, going back to the, the 1950s uh, here in our, our neighbor to the north. Uh, there was a, a set of experiments uh, conducted by uh, psychologist Muzaffar Sharif and his wife Carolyn Wood Sharif. Uh, where they got these boys who were between the ages of 11 and 12, and they brought them to this camp called Robbers Cave State Park. And they ran it like a, a normal like a Boy Scout camp or something like that, except uh, they were looking to see how people bonded, especially young children bonded, when they worked together as a group, and then how they interacted with each other and with other groups once they, their group was in competition uh, with uh, yet another group. So uh, they, they set up this camp in, uh, to progress in, in three stages. First was the bonding stage. This is where they got uh, groups of boys together and they had them uh, carry out common goals where they would be building tents, they would be uh, doing uh, cooperative exercises that uh, didn't have any competition. They weren't like games where one group competed against another. They all had to work together. And the bonding stage was followed by the competition stage. It was at this point that each group, uh, though they had been operating separate from each other, uh, each group then became aware of the existence of the other group. One of the first things they did was each group came up with a name for itself. Uh, one group called itself the Eagles, another group called itself the Rattlers. And once they established these group identities, uh, they then were put into competition in baseball games and tug of war and things like this. But this quickly got out of hand, like a lot of experiments like this, where uh, the Eagles would go try to steal the, the Rattlers flag or the Rattlers try to steal the Eagles flag, even though this wasn't actually part of a game at a certain point. Uh, they would break into each other's cabins and steal each other's stuff. And of course, they would get into fist fights. Um, this kind of thing happened at a uh, much greater rate between groups than it ever happened within a group. Now you would expect you know, young boys to, to end up fighting each other, uh, which you know, they did, but it was almost always an eagle was uh, you know, beaten up by a rattler or uh, vice versa. It was rarely an eagle versus an eagle or a rattler versus a rattler. This stage was interesting not only because they competed with each other, but one thing that the psychologists discovered at this stage was not only did they sort of carry this competition beyond the uh, athletic arena, 
uh, but they also started to think of each other as fundamentally different. The Eagles would describe the, the Rattlers as bullies or as cheaters or as liars, all these negative characteristics. And they would describe themselves as uh, virtuous, as playing fair, as only, uh, only fighting if they were attacked first and, uh, and this sort of thing. Uh, but of course the Rattlers said the exact opposites, that they said they were the honest ones, they were the ones that played fair, it was the Eagles that cheated. Um, and these weren't just immediate defenses of in, uh, in individual actions, they were often just, uh, the psychologist would ask them, what do you think of the Rattlers? And uh, with nothing else to go on, uh, these uh, boys would refer to each other, uh, the other group is very negative and their own group is, is very positive. That stage was followed by the uh, reduction of friction or reducing friction stage. In this stage, they were required to do, each group was required to do things with the other group to cooperate. Uh, so one thing they had to do was fix a, a water tank uh, that was supposedly broken. It wasn't actually broken, but it was made to look that way so that they had to put their minds together to figure out how to fix it. Uh, when a delivery truck broke down, or supposedly broke down, they had to, instead of playing tug of war against each other, they had to unite because only the co combined group of the Rattlers and the Eagles uh, were gonna be able to move this heavy object in, in order to get the uh, supplies to their camp. So once this happened, these, uh, the, the infighting or the, the fighting between groups uh, was reduced, but also the stereotypes, the, the slandering, the accusing each other of, of being underhanded and deceptive and that sort of thing, those things were reduced. Uh, so what uh, Muzaffar Sharif uh, uh, eventually wrote about in this article was, uh, this was an example, he set out to see how groups interacted with each other, but more importantly how they thought of each other in times when those groups are in competition with each other for limited resources. But uh, how that changes when those groups are uh, combining their efforts for common resources. And so groups have a, an in-group bias, that is they assign positive characteristics to their own group, uh, but they have an out-group hostility. Uh, that is they're, they're automatically hostile to people who are in a, a rival group even though they don't know those, those individuals. So once these groups identify these icons that, that unify them, uh, and the icons that uh, unify their, their rivals, they ignored the fact that these groups were created entirely arbitrarily. Uh, each individual boy was uh, assigned to one group or another based on no independent characteristics. Uh, it didn't matter what the individual was like before they were part of the group, uh, they were just completely randomly assigned. But when the boys were asked to describe individual members of their own group or individual members of the other group, they wouldn't respond to those individuals as individuals, they would respond to them as rattlers or as eagles. Uh, as if it wasn't an external characteristic uh, that they were part of this external group, but as if being an eagle was an internal characteristic. It, it determined who they were inside, who they were as individuals. Uh, this is called essentialism. Uh, essentialism is the belief that uh, people of a particular group, or each individual of a partic particular group, uh, is defined by natural internal characteristics uh, that remain constant through different external situations. Uh, essentialism presumes there's an essence to who you are, that uh, it's, it's internal, uh, it doesn't change, it's uh, uh, more important than uh, external characteristics like what group you're a part of or how you act in one situation. We essentialize people in different political groups, different religious groups, uh, I including ourselves. We assume uh, I am this way because I am a member of that group. Uh, to be an American is to be this, to be a Christian is to be this. Uh, rather than saying the opposite, which is because I was raised as part of this group, this group has had this influence on me as an individual. Uh, I tend to think that, um, that these characteristics aren't coming from outside, that they're coming from inside. Uh, we do this with religion, we do this with politics, we do this with different groups. Uh, we also do this with gender. If I told you that uh, either Muzaffar Sharif or his wife, Carolyn Wood Sharif, one of the two was good with children and one of the two was good with uh, fixing things around the house, you would probably assume that the husband was the one that was good at fixing things and the wife was the one that was good with children. Uh, we s tend to assume that these are internal characteristics, that women are just naturally one way, men are just naturally another way. Uh, and of course, there are statistical uh, uh, regularities where it might be more common for women to be one way and men to be another way. But we also have the external pressure from our culture that pushes us as men to act a certain way and as women to, to act a, another way. 
And just like we, uh, just like the eagles and rattlers tended to define each other based on their groups, uh, of course we have a, a millennia long tradition of defining people by their uh, religious beliefs or even the religious beliefs of the groups that they're a part of. Uh, rather than seeing them as members of a group uh, where the individuals may or may not have something in, in common with the other individuals around them. Uh, just because one person self-identifies as Christian or self-identifies as Muslim, we presume we know certain things about them. Although, as you uh, probably noticed when we read the book of Genesis, uh, a lot of what we assume constitutes Christianity or Judaism doesn't actually come from the Bible. And when you ask people uh, who identify themselves as Christians about uh, individual uh, beliefs uh, or doctrines, uh, you ask them, you know, if they're Nicene Christians, uh, you know, what their, their belief is about the Trinity. Uh, you know, do they uh, accept uh, uh, that Christ was of like substance with God or a similar substance with God? All of these were extremely fundamental uh, debates in early Christianity, but uh, debates which modern Christians almost never know anything about. So are these defining characteristics? Are people actually being defined by their beliefs? Or are they defined by a group, and when asked what they believe, do they then go look to that group to find out what they're supposed to believe? Uh, that is, I'm asking you, are you really, as an individual, characterized by this thing, or you, do you just assume that you should be because you're part of this group? Just like we tend to fall into the essentialist type of thinking, where we assume that uh, people are determined by a certain essence, we also tend to assume that the groups that we're part of have something in common uh, beyond just the group membership itself. Uh, we tend to believe that people in our group all have a, a common essence that unites us, even if we don't know those individual people. So imagine that you are uh, here on campus and you see someone else wearing uh, a Texas A&M Corpus Christi t-shirt. Uh, it probably wouldn't strike you as, as very interesting, but if you were in, uh, if you were in New Orleans and you saw someone wearing a Tamu CC t-shirt, you might say, oh, there's a member of my community. And this might be somebody you've never met before, you've never seen before, but you feel that, oh, this is someone I know, or at least someone I have something in common with. And imagine if you saw somebody with a uh, uh, University of Texas shirt on in London. Uh, you're in London, you've got a Tamu CC shirt on, they, are, they have a, a Texas, uh, University of Texas shirt on. Uh, even though there's different universities, this is someone you've never met before, you feel like they're part of your community. Uh, so these are people that are not part of our face-to-face -face community, people we don't actually know, but we imagine that we have something in common because we have this uh, group that we're a part of. Uh, this is uh, what the philosopher and historian Benedict Anderson called an imagined community. So an imagined community is a group of individuals that identify with each other, even if they don't personally know each other. Uh, they may define their community and themselves according to a common group, uh, the group's name, the symbols of that group, the doctrines of that group, even if they don't know all the doctrines of that group, the regions that they're from, the languages that they speak, uh, the accents that they have, uh, all sorts of other characteristics like this that don't actually tell us anything about that individual. So the difference between an imagined community and an actual community is in an actual community, you know the people in your community. If you don't know them, then they're not really part of your community. Uh, there is sort of a fuzzy boundary out there where there's the people that you know, and then there's the people that the people you know know, and you may not know them. So uh, they're, they're sort of on the outside of your community. Uh, but an imagined community would just be uh, the, the type of thing we're dealing with when we say that there are the, the Christian uh, kingdoms of Spain and they're the Muslim kingdoms of Spain. Uh, as we see, El Cid is one of these people who doesn't really fit. I mean, he is ostensibly Christian, and if you asked him uh, whether he believed uh, you know, there was no God but Allah and, and Muhammad was a prophet, he would probably say that's not a foundational belief of mine, uh, whereas that uh, you know, God so loved the world he sent his only begotten son, that would be a foundational belief. But that doesn't really determine his community, as we saw, when he is exiled by Alfonso, uh, Alfonso is a Christian, El Cid is a Christian, but El Cid uh, has to leave Castile, and then he goes into the community of Zaragoza and fights on behalf of the, the Muslim kingdom of Zaragoza against the Christian kingdom of Barcelona. So he's one of these people who uh, moves from one group to another, uh, even though his religion probably doesn't change. It's just that that religion doesn't determine his community. And that's something that is hard for a lot of people to understand when they uh, read uh, the Song of the Cid or look at the historical uh, El Cid. 
uh, it seems maybe that he's betrayed his faith or something like that according to our terms, but all he's really done is not fit our stereotype, not fit our assumptions about what is supposed to characterize the individuals of that group. So what are we supposed to do if we can't just judge people or individuals by the groups that they're a part of? Uh, well, that leads us back to this uh, necessity of theory of mind. Uh, remember that theory of mind requires us to understand individual thinking at the individual level, not just to say, well, if he's a Muslim, he must think like this, or if he's a Christian, he must think like this. That's appealing to stereotypes. Uh, and the psychologists, uh, David Comer Kidd and Emmanuel Castano, pointed out that uh, literary fiction, fiction that makes us distance ourselves from stereotypes, uh, conventions, familiar schemata, the, the way we expect things to go, the scripts we're accustomed to, uh, literature that defamiliarizes these common expectations, they force us to look at each individual character at the level of their thinking and their thinking about other people's thinking. So whereas many of our, they say, whereas many of our mundane social experiences may be scripted by convention and informed by stereotypes, those presented in literary fiction disrupt our expectations. They defamiliarize the, our approach to understanding the world and the people in it. Readers of literary fiction must draw on more flexible interpretive resources to infer the feelings and thoughts of ca characters. That is, they must engage in theory of mind processes. And that's what we have to do with El Cid. If we looked at El Cid, the, the summary of the Song of the Cid, we could say that, oh, here's this Christian fighting against Muslims. Okay, I know the basic conflict here. I know what drives El Cid. I know what he wants to accomplish. And by conquering the city of Valencia and making it his own kingdom, as a Christian, he's conquered a Muslim kingdom and that's this, that's the protagonist being successful, the end. That's, that's all there really is to know about the Song of the Cid. But if that's what you thought, you would completely miss all of the, uh, the conflicts that uh, determine the action of the poem and the focus of the poem. If we divided all the characters up according to their religious affiliation, we might assume that uh, El Cid should uh, protect his daughters against Abin Gabon, uh, the Moorish king of Molina. Uh, and that he could rely on somebody like Count Garcia Ordonez or the or Diego and Fernando Gonzalez, the the Infantes of Carrion. Uh, although that would have him, you know, these are precisely the people that he finds that he cannot trust. These are Christian nobles who are supposed to have certain individual characteristics derived from being Christians. They're supposed to be uh, uh, sexually virtuous. They're supposed to be honest. Uh, these are things that they're clearly not. They're abusive. Um, they are deceitful. Uh, they just want to exploit El Cid. They want to marry his daughters only because they want El Cid's money. And the fact that they're nobles, we might assume according to the conventional logic of the time and uh, the Carion nobles themselves say that because we are noble, that even though we've beaten and nearly killed these young women, uh, they're the daughters of a, a commoner, so they have actually been honored by our abuse because we're nobles and they're not, so uh, when we beat them and, and leave them for dead in the woods, that actually uh, is an honor for them to even be acknowledged by us, superior nobles. And so these identity categories that were taken for granted are being completely upended, they're turned on their head by uh, the, the narrative of the poem itself. So we can't come to this poem assuming that our stereotypes are gonna be validated. Now, there are certain stereotypes that we'll see play out the way we expect them to, and uh, sometimes disappointingly so. Uh, in particular, there are the, the Jewish characters, Raguel and Vidas, who uh, lend El Cid some money, and El Cid deceives them, and it's kind of hard to interpret how we're supposed to take this. Uh, the uh, we, we have them lend El Cid all this gold when he's going into exile. Uh, El Cid fills this uh, safe full of sand so that it is heavy so that they think there's gold in there. They bury it and then uh, later in book two or in, in Canto two, they come back to find El Cid and say, look, we're gonna be ruined unless you pay back our debt. Please, you know, please pay us back uh, what we lent you now that El Cid has all of this money because of all these conquests he's made. And we're never told what happens to them and it seems uh, that their case is just dismissed, uh, that they uh, don't deserve uh, the sort of requital that they were promised. And so it's kind of hard to, for us to, to see this as anything other than sort of anti-Semitism. Um, and we're never really given anything more to, uh, to use to interpret that. Uh, we see Christians ex uh, acting the way we would expect Christians to act in a, 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 an army or a, 
uh, Christian versus Muslim sort of Crusades era uh, events, when we see Don Geronimo, uh, his only goal seems to be uh, fighting Moors. He wants to fight Muslims and convert uh, new territories to Christianity. And that's all he does, that, that's all that drives him, There's, that's the only conflict uh, he runs into. And of course we have a lot of uh, sort of ca Muslim characters who aren't really well described. Uh, their only uh, uh, drive, their only goal seems to be fighting against Christians. And so King Youssef of Morocco, uh, who is based on uh, the historical uh, king of the Berbers, the Almoravid um, uh, war leader who uh, came to unite the taifas and, and make them more uh, uh, radical uh, and, and unified against the Christians. Uh, but in the narrative, he's just sort of a, a typical like Muslim that El Cid fights because he's a Muslim, uh, and that's the end of it. But we also have more complicated characters whose thinking we have, uh, whose, whose mental states, uh, whose thinking processes get more attention from the narrator. Uh, one of those is Ibn Galbon on uh, page 105, uh, section or chapter 83. Uh, we find that uh, he's the, the Muslim king of Molina, and we're told, or El Cid says, that I've made peace with him and I know he'll join you with another hundred men. So this is someone he's looking to, he says he's made peace with him, so at, at some point they must have had, uh, that must have been uh, opponents, but for whatever reason, now he knows that this uh, Muslim king is gonna be very loyal to him, he trusts him to uh, give safe passage to his, uh, his men and his daughters. And the narrator tells us that uh, uh, Ibn Galban did not blink an eye. Gladly, he said, that night uh, he gave them a great feast. And then later uh, in chapter 126 and 127, on uh, page 183, uh, even when the, the Infantes of Carion uh, go uh, back the other direction and they're, they're taking El Cid's daughters uh, whom uh, they've married, Ibn Galban comes out to give them safe passage and to welcome them, and the Carions are going, or are planning to, out loud, they're uh, planning to uh, uh, kill him and, and take his uh, wealth. They say that uh, we know we'll soon be rid of these girls, and if we can kill Ibn Galban, this Moor, everything he owns will be ours. And one of uh, Ibn Galban's uh, men overhears this and goes and tells him, and rather than immediately uh, attacking them or imprisoning them or whatever, uh, he just rides up to them and says, well, you know, what have I done to you noblemen? I've gone out of my way and you're planning my death. Uh, love for El Cid is all that keeps me from doing things to you that would ring in the whole world's ears. So we clearly have uh, this uh, uh, Moorish uh, Muslim king uh, shown to be much more noble, much more patient, much more upright and, uh, and respectable uh, than these uh, Christian nobles. Uh, and he also shows them, uh, he, he's much more gracious to them even though they've just been plotting to kill him. Uh, so we contrast him with the Christian nobles, the, the Carions. Uh, we have this, this defamiliarization of type, uh, the type being not only Christian but also uh, noble that is supposed to be somebody who's more honest than commoners, who's more successful uh, on the battlefield, more successful in, in business and personal responsibility and all this, but in all of these things we see the, the Carions consistently failing. Uh, they, they lose all the money that they take, even when the, the money that they take uh, that's, that's not, that, that they haven't earned. Uh, they're completely financially incompetent, they're self-indulgent, and the only reason they want to marry El Cid's daughters is because they want his wealth, because they think, well, to be noble we have to have money, so let's take the money from a commoner, but when uh, they realize that marrying a commoner's daughters is an insult to them, then they want to kill them, and they even say that killing these girls would actually elevate our honor, because we don't want to be associated with them. And so we're left to wonder, uh, what's going on in these guys' heads? The narrator's ideas of justice and of nobility and of, of, of noble character, at least, versus the conventional assumptions expressed by uh, the Carions are clearly at odds. We, we have to understand their thinking even as we reject it, uh, comparing it to another type of standard, another type of criteria for what makes a person good. Uh, so this is uh, a theory of mind exercise as well. To, to disagree with somebody, we have to understand two things. We have to understand how they think and we have to contrast it to something else. Uh, but when we see someone like Ibn Galban uh, responding to their treachery by 
being open and sort of rejecting them but not uh, stooping to their level, uh, we see his thinking uh, compared to their thinking and we see his way of thinking about their thinking. Uh, we see why his character is opposed to their characters. But we also have to understand why they think they are in, uh, the, the Carions think that they're entitled to wealth even though they haven't earned it. Why they think they're entitled to abuse the daughters of El Cid. Why uh, Count Garcia Ordonez thinks he's entitled to uh, uh, deface uh, or to defame El Cid. And why they all seem to think that as El Cid becomes more successful and more popular, their honor is diminished. They, they seem to think uh, honor is a, a zero sum game, where if somebody else has more, then that means I have less. Now there are other ways to, to see the world that are different than the way the Carrions and, and Garcia Ordonia see them. Uh, but we have to understand theirs uh, is different than the way El Cid and uh, Felix Munez and Alvar Fanez and Pedro Bermudez all see the world. But we also see the character of Alfonso sort of caught between them. He's got to decide, do I think the way Garcia Ordonez says, or do I think the way El Cid does? And we see him sort of going back and forth uh, in his uh, uh, mental uh, representation of what's happening. And not only is El Cid and Ibn Gabon a good contrast to the way the, the Carrions seem to think, but Pedro Bermudez is, a, is another great character that I think uh, is sort of underrepresented in uh, the Song of the Cid. He doesn't get uh, talked about that much. Uh, but notice, he's the one who uh, is referred to as uh, Pedro Muto, uh, dumb Pedro, or Pedro the Mute, the one who never talks. It's not that he can't talk, he just rarely does. And in chapter 142 and 143, this is on page 221, uh, at the trial of the, the Carrions, uh, Pedro uh, is asked to speak and he's, uh, he sort of feels insulted by El, El Cid's description. And we're told he tried to talk, but his tongue stopped him and would not let a word come out. But once again, believe me, no one could stop him. Or once he began, believe me, no one could stop him. And then he says, Cid, that becomes a habit, especially at court, you call me dumb Pedro. Uh, you know, in fact, I can talk better, but nothing's ever missing from what I do. Uh, so he's not a very good speaker, whereas the Carrions are very good speakers. Uh, He's not very good at articulating uh, what the, the right thing to do is, but he's good at doing the right thing. And this, in this, his characterization is, is diametrically opposed to the, the Carrions. Uh, we find out a lot about what he thinks, not from what he says throughout the poem, but what he does. Remember that back in chapter 115 on page 163, we have something missing from this uh, fight where the, the Carrions were still uh, accompanying El Cid in the battlefield. And there's a missing section. We're told there's a full page missing from the manuscript, perhaps 50 lines. We know from the chronicles that the first speaker below is one of the Carrions who had proposed to join the fight but turned and ran when a Moor attacked him. Pedro Bermudez uh, kills the Moor and brings the man's horse to the Carrion so he can claim to have won the battle. Uh, so Pedro helps this Carrion fool the rest of the men uh, so he can pretend that he has defeated someone in battle. It, keep in mind, they have never beaten anybody. Uh, they've never uh, had any sort of success on the battlefield. But Pedro wants to help them deceive everybody else so that they appear brave, uh, and hoping that that will actually make them uh, more honorable. Uh, once they uh, sort of uh, maybe come to identify themselves as brave or when others identify them as brave. Very similar to what Bodvar Bjarki does for Hot or Hjotli uh, in uh, uh, Hrolf Kraki saga. Let's take this coward out to the battlefield uh, and then once everybody thinks that he's uh, just won a victory, maybe he'll sort of grow in to fit the part. Uh, that's what Pedro does, but clearly the Carrions don't do that. But the reason we know what happens there is because uh, Pedro then tells the whole story that's missing in that missing page. He tells that story in chapter 143. And so whether it's the, the Carrions trying to deceive everyone else or trying to state out loud the way they think, uh, or it's Ibn Gabon or uh, Pedro Bermudez uh, contrasting uh, themselves to the Carrions and articulating one way or another the failure of character in the Carrions. We have, in all these cases, people representing to themselves the way they think the world is and representing other people's representations in their minds and then contrasting those. And we see those second and third level uh, theories of mind uh, in conflict. 
And we have to understand this thinking in order to understand anything that happens. Uh, because if we don't understand that the, the carions are the, the main threat, then we don't understand how their thinking leads to the conflict that is central to the, the narrator's description. If the, the carions were simply motivated by greed, we could understand that easily. If uh, the Christians and Muslims were simply motivated by their religion, we could understand that easily. But we don't get get it that easy in the Song of the Cid. We have to understand each individual's thinking to understand why they do what they do and why that requires a particular action from someone else. Uh, so in other words, in order to uh, understand what happens, we have to understand how people think and how they think about other people thinking. Uh, that's how we understand the characters and that's how we understand where the conflict comes from. And you can't understand a narrative without understanding the conflict. Every narrative is gonna have some sort of conflict. Uh, so the literary theorist uh, David Herman says that the conflicts that participants encounter in trying to actualize their plans, whether because of unpredicted obstacles, conflicting plans hatched by other participants, or other difficulties, confer on sequences in, in the narrative the noteworthiness or tellability distinguishing a story from a stereotype or a script. Uh, from this perspective, conflict is constitutive of narrative. Uh, it, it makes a narrative. Uh, though its source, the source of the conflict, the manifestations of the conflict, and the relative pervasiveness of the conflict are going to vary from narrative to narrative. So we can distinguish two types of conflict, and I've I mentioned this in the past when we talked about uh, Gilgamesh. There's the proximate goal a character has, that is the immediate goal that the protagonist recognizes and tries to achieve. So think about Gilgamesh trying to achieve immortality. Uh, that's contrasted with the ultimate goal, and that's what the protagonist ultimately gains. And it's almost always different than the proximate goal. So uh, Gilgamesh goes in search of immortality. Uh, he doesn't get it, but he understands how to become a better king. Even though the historical El Cid is known for his conquests on the battlefield, and even though these battles with uh, Christian kings like the Count of Barcelona, uh, Muslim kings like uh, King Yusuf, uh, these take up a lot of the, the text, those individual battles are all proximate goals. They're something he has to do in the uh, immediate present but there are ways to uh, a more ultimate goal. Uh, namely, this is the way he's going to survive in exile and hope to show his loyalty to King Alfonso. Uh, so he's got two ultimate goals. All these individual battles are proximate goals. His two ultimate goals are one, uh, prove his loyalty to Alfonso. And he does this even when he's in exile by sending some of the spoils of war uh, back to King Alfonso. He sends, um, Alvar Fañez back with horses and gold and, and swords that are uh, taken from uh, conquered Muslims. And he sends them these back as, as signs of loyalty and he, he frequently says, you know, I want to uh, win back the trust of King Alfonso. And when King Alfonso finally does come out and they, they see each other face to face, El Cid gets down on his knees and sort of kisses the ground because he wants to show how, how loyal he is. But his other ultimate goal is uh, to protect his family and in particular to eventually someday hoping to give his daughters away in marriage. Uh, when he leaves, has to leave his daughters and his wife with Don Sancho, the abbot, uh, he, he holds his daughters up and he says, uh, may it please God and his mother Mary that someday these hands will give them in marriage. These two goals are gonna come into conflict when the king decides that his daughter should be given in marriage to the Carions. Uh, there we see him give up this thing that he initially said was one of his uh, lifelong goals, and that is to give his daughters in marriage away. He says, I can't do that. He doesn't trust the Carions, and so he, has, uh, he tells the king, you have to give them away. You've made this choice, uh, you give them away in marriage. And it's actually fortunate that he does, because once he does that, and the uh, Carions uh, try to you know, kill their wives and leave them for dead, they act as bad husbands, they haven't just insulted El Cid, because the king has given El Cid's daughters away in marriage, they have defied the king. And so they've turned themselves against the king, and that's what ultimately undoes them. But to understand why there's so much focus on the Carions themselves, and then the marriage with the Carions, and then what they do to the daughters, and then uh, the, the trial at the end, if we don't understand these goals coming into conflict with each other, uh, then we don't understand why there's all this focus where we thought there would just be this constant battle between Christians and Muslims. So, character goals lead to conflicts between characters, the conflict leads to the construction of the plot, uh, but there's also uh, cues that the narrator uh, will leave for us to understand other thematic conflicts. And so 
we don't just have themes where a certain thing is symbolized or some abstract concept is represented. We have conflicting themes. We have themes in conflict, like uh, whether or not uh, no, being born to the nobility makes you a better person, or whether it's what you do, your actions that, that make you a more quote unquote noble. Uh, so the definition of the word nobility, that's a, uh, a theme of, of two different interpretations that are constantly in conflict. Um, how to respond to attacks, to insults, to violence. Uh, we see the, the Carions uh, respond to insults that were never even there. Uh, when they're afraid of the, this lion uh, that belongs to El Cid and everyone laughs at them, uh, they act as if uh, someone had done something to them. This had all been a conspiracy against them to humiliate them when it actually it's their own uh, actions that uh, brought the, the, the laughter of other people. And El Cid was very measured. He tells his men not to laugh at the Carions uh, for hiding from this lion. Uh, we contrast what they perceive as an insult and how they respond to it. They respond by trying to kill El Cid's daughters. Um, we can contrast that to the fact that when they tried to kill El Cid's daughters, that was the, the worst kind of attack you can do to another person, and yet El Cid has this very uh, measured response. He's very patient and he wants to find a, uh, a legal solution uh, rather than just uh, overpowering and killing these guys, which he could easily have done. And with the swords, uh, Tizone and Colada, uh, we have these sort of markers that, you know, obviously they don't have minds, they can't. Uh, express a particular point of view and then uh, sort of see that point of view in conflict with another point of view. But they aren't necessarily symbols, uh, although you may argue that they are, so much as an objective correlative, this is a term which I'm not gonna ask you to learn, but uh, if you see an object that is consistently uh, used to focus your attention on one uh, issue or one sort of uh, thread of the narrative, then that's what, uh, that T.S. Eliot and others have called a, a, an objective correlative. It's an object that correlates to something else happening in this narrative. And Tizona and Colada, remember, are won by El Cid on the battlefield. He takes them from these uh, two kings, uh, Yusef and the Count of Barcelona. Uh, and then he, he doesn't, we're not told that he uses them for you know fighting, but he gives them as wedding gifts, first to the Carions when they uh, marry his uh, daughters, and then once they get caught uh, trying to cheat him, they're the first things that he has taken away from them at this trial. And when he takes them away, he gives them to Pedro Bermudez and to Martin Antolinez, and then Pedro and Martin use them in uh, single combat against the Carions. So the Carions, we, we see the, the swords as El Cid's accomplishments on the battlefield. He passes those accomplishments on to these two guys who ha don't have any accomplishments on the battlefield uh, as a symbol of uh, his own sort of devotion to them as his new sons-in-law. They fail to live up to the, uh, the, the honor represented by these swords and so those swords are taken away from them and then used against them in actual uh, uh, violent combat and then uh, they are both described as seeing these swords about to strike them down during the, the combat and uh, each of the Carions um, uh, begs for mercy when they look at either uh, Tizone or Colada. They, they recognize that they are unworthy, that they are uh, defeated uh, by these weapons that they were once offered. And so if your goal, your goal as a reader uh, in reading the Song of the Cid was to figure out what happens, uh, as you read, you're probably thinking, okay, what do I need to know? And if I, uh, to, to figure out what I need to know, I need to know, uh, who are the mo most important characters? Which of these events is the most important? Uh, what do I need to be focusing on? Now that you've sort of seen what happens, uh, we, when you first read uh, this narrative or any other uh, text, uh, you don't really know what to focus on. Uh, you don't really know which of these things is gonna be important later on. Now that you've read it, you realize that the, the final battle, so to speak, the, the climax of the uh, narrative, isn't what you may have expected. You may have ex been expecting it uh, to be a, a confrontation between El Cid and Alfonso. You may have expected it to be a conflict between Christians and Muslims. Uh, but what you find is this sort of uh, trial by combat, which is not just combat, it's also a trial. And it's not just the Carions that are on trial, it is what they represent. These uh, Christian nobles who don't live up to the characteristics that either of those identities are supposed to live up to. Uh, and instead we have these uh, the, these common men, uh, like El Cid, like Pedro Bunez, like Martin Antolinez, uh, representing the virtues that the, the nobility was were supposed to have. And we see that the honorable characteristics are not exclusively shared uh, 
by Christians. They're also a product of uh, Muslims, at least like Ibn Gabon. And if we take this recognition of how the, the conflict sort of come to a head, and we go back and reread the, the novel, these things start to make a lot more sense. You start to see the conflicts building up. You see them introduced even though they weren't um, uh, so obvious to us at, at the beginning. So to take for example in the beginning, in, in Canto One, when El Cid leaves his daughters with Don Sancho, the abbot, uh, and he says, I hope to one day give them in marriage, that line probably didn't seem that significant at the time. It was just one of a hundred other things you're trying to process uh, as you're focusing on the fact that he's about to leave. You're focusing on where he's going now. But that line, going back, once you realize how this is gonna come into conflict later on, becomes much more important. And this is why you always benefit from a second reading. Uh, conflicts never come out of nowhere, at least in, in good writing they don't, in, in well thought out writing. But a lot of times they're introduced and we don't notice them when they're introduced. A lot of times uh, a character's disposition, a character's way of thinking uh, is sort of introduced and we just assume, oh this says something about his char this character that may be no more significant than what he's wearing. But if we see later on that that uh, expression of a way of thinking actually leads to a conflict we didn't see coming. Then we go back and read and we see, oh, okay, here's where this character's thinking is introduced, and now I see how that's going to lead to a conflict with another character who thinks in a different way. Uh, LC, just like everything else that we've read, really benefits from a second reading, and I strongly encourage you uh, to go back and read this uh, if you have time, and just to s even to, to skim over it, a lot of things are gonna be become suddenly more obviously important uh, that you may not have noticed before. And when you're trying to decide what do I need to remember, what do I need to pay attention to, focus on the conflict and the character psychologies that lead to that conflict.